Hi, and welcome to uh, week three, part two. Um, in this video, we're going to go through a bit more of the nitty gritty of writing code, what you actually type when you write code. So we've already gotten a little bit of an overview. We've understood what programming languages are, how they work, how the computer takes uh, what you write and turns it into action or executes that code. Um, but that still doesn't tell you really what to expect the first time you sit down and you're gonna start typing. So we're gonna go through that a little bit with some examples today here. Um, so the first thing that you need to know is that when you, um, you sit down, you open up your IDE and you are met with nothing. There is a blank page and um, it's up to you to uh, define what you need to start, right? And this is very broad terms. I'm gonna try to explain it as best I can. So in order to write code and to um, have some data, some information, and to do something with that information, you need to specify the data itself. Okay, what that means practically is that if you are going to, for example, add two numbers together, you need to let the computers know, um, here is the first number that I'm going to add, and here is the second number I'm going to add. So you do that, and um, in order for the code to run, the computer takes these numbers, saves it into its memory, so that uh, you can perform uh, a calculation on that. So um, you need to define the data first that you're going to uh, manipulate in your code. Uh, so let's use a metaphor to explain this. If you are making a cake, you don't just have the instructions because you need to gather all the ingredients before you can start adding them together and doing things and putting it in the oven. You gather them all, your ingredients, you put them on the table. And this is what I mean that you need to define your data. You need to uh, tell the computer to save the data that you need uh, in, uh, to code before you start using it. So say that you are going to um, add two numbers together. Um, we save this data uh, in something called variables. So what is a variable? A variable is a um, little box that the computer saves in its memory and you tell the computer what this box will contain. Um, I like to use the idea of um, a, a, a moving box, uh, one of those you, cardboard boxes you use when you, when you move. Um, and the content within that box. So the variable itself is just the space that you're asking the computer to reserve for, what, for whatever you want to put in there. Um, you, in JavaScript, and that's the language I'm most familiar with, so I'm going to use that as an example, you start off by using a keyword, uh, usually the word uh, let, um, to inform the computer that, hey, we are going to create a variable, so I want you to save this box, this space, somewhere, uh, and, I, and this is what it's going to contain. So let a, and that's going to be our first number, uh, equals five, for example. So we have a couple of components here. The let part lets the computer know. I don't think that's where it comes from, but it is a funny coincidence. Um, let the computer know that we are going to create a variable. A is the name you choose for your variable. You can write asked, you could write uh, 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 a nonsensical uh, uh, just keyboard bash, uh, or you could write uh, number A to explain what this box is going to contain but it is your name that you choose for your variable. Then the equals part is when you inform the computer what your box is going to contain. In this case, it's the number five. It could be a um, 
string of characters, that is uh, th then you have quotation marks and you maybe write the word hello within uh, two quotation marks. And then your box is going to contain the word hello. So if you're going to uh, write a piece of code that adds two numbers together, you need to let the computer know that this is the first number that we're going to add and this is the second number we're going to add. So you need to create them. You need to have the computer reserve them in memory. And only once you've done this, can you manipulate that or use them in your code, right? So the same way as you need uh, ingredients before you can start making your cake, you need to let the computer know um, the data that uh, is needed to run instructions on. So when learning about variables, you need to be aware of a couple of things here. I've already talked about the variable name, the name that you choose for your variable. Um, each variable has a data type. So when we have data information that we use when programming, they can be uh, categorized into different data types. Um, I've already mentioned number. So in, in JavaScript, a number is just any number. We also have something called a string. So that is short for a string of characters. And that is essentially text. It could be one word, it could be a book. All of that is counts as a string of characters. So then the data type there is string. Um, you can also have uh, something called a Boolean. Um, this essentially uh, means true or false. Um, so if you have, um, for example, um, we already talked about keywords. So when we're creating a new variable in JavaScript, we use the word let and we say that our variable is going to be called true. And then we need to give this variable a value. If we use a Boolean, we're going to give it the value either true or false. So if we create it using let, we name it true. Then when we give it the value, we write equals true. Um, this is useful for when you want to check if a condition is true or false and based on if it is true or false, then you have uh, something happen. So say that we want to cross the street. Um, we can um, write if the, green, uh, if the light is green, uh, if uh, light green equals true, do something, right? Uh, so this true or false corresponds directly to the ones and zeros that we've been thinking about. And this data type then is called a Boolean. Um, we have, gosh, what else do we have? In different languages, you have different um, data types that are uh, common. So I already mentioned that we have number in JavaScript. In Java, for example, you need to specify if it's a whole number, meaning if it, it doesn't have any decimals, or if it has decimals. Um, this allows the computer to um, hold the appropriate amount of memory for, for whatever you want it to have. So um, say that you say that it's a, a whole number, then it might reserve uh, eight bits. But if it's, uh, and that's not a true num, a true, uh, that's not a real memory space. It's just something I'm giving you an example with. But if it's a number with a decimal point, if it's a fraction, it might need 12 bits to hold that information. And so in JavaScript, um, that kind of gets solved by itself. But in Java, you do need to specify and then the computer um, reserves the uh, amount of memory for that specific data type. So then we have the keyword to create a new variable, let. We have the name that you give it and then you write equals and then whatever comes after equals, that is the value that you give that variable. So why do we do this? Why don't we just write the number uh, 22? 
instead of saving it into a, a variable, a, a box, a container. Well, the thing is that if you have one specific um, thing that you need to remember all the time, uh, it's easier to save it into a container than writing out the value each time. So say that you were going to use lyrics. So you would uh, create the variable let lyrics equals, and you would have a whole song in that. So instead of every time you want to use those lyrics, uh, instead of typing out the lyrics uh, every single time, you can just um, ask the computer to um, go into its memory, look up your variable that you named, and then the computer is going to give you the value that you've saved. So instead of, of copy pasting the song lyrics over and over again, when you say lyrics, the computer gets the, uh, the long song lyrics for you. Um, and it's not just useful for saving um, or, or making sure that your code isn't super long. What if you had something that needed to change over time? My cat's being a rascal. Uh, what if you had something that you needed to change over time? What if you needed to know, um, update something, say the time, say that, um, you needed to, uh, check what the time is and then add time from the, uh, add, add hours to the original time instead of then going back to the code and seeing what uh, the original time was, you can ask the computer um, for uh, the value of the variable and then have that same value and manipulate it again. So I like to use the idea of a, of a, of a, to of a uh, cardboard box and a toy in it. So if the box itself is the variable, the toy is the value and the type is children's toy, for example. Um, and then the memory, how that works is that, uh, say that your garage is uh, the computer's memory. So whenever you want your toy or a toy, you don't go to the store and buy a new one and just have a bunch, have um, stores and stores of toys in your garage. When you want your toy, when you need your toy, you go to the garage and get the one you've already saved. And that is the idea of variables, basically. So for example, uh, for updating um, variables, say that you had a register of people's names. Um, so you had person A name equals something. That is, that is the value that is stored for that person, that person's name. So the reason you want a variable, you want um, a dedicated box to hold this information is that what if that person changes their name? Well, then you can just update the variable. So you have um, name person A, and it used to be Anna. And Anna changes her name to Sarah. So then you can just use the same variable and write over it, update the value. So when you create it, you need to use the keyword let name person A equals Anna. Then when you update it, you reference the same variable name person A because the computer has already stored it in its memory. So you're asking the computer to put the box back into play and then you write equals again and then you can update the value. So you write name person A equals and now you have uh, and now you specify the new name. So Sarah, then the next time you're going to ask the computer to go get the value of that, it's going to give you uh, the updated name. And in programming, a lot of the time you have data and then you want to manipulate it and you want to save the, the new version of that. And that is why variables are very, very useful as well. So when looking at different programming languages, we can categorize them into something called 
statically typed and dynamically typed. So since we started off with the with JavaScript as, a, as an example, let's start with dynamically typed. When you have dynamically typed uh, languages, you don't need to specify the data type when you create it. It's always let. Let is the keyword to create a new variable. Um, and you don't let the computer know if it's a number or a, a string of characters or a Boolean or whatever it might be. You just say, hey, save some space for this one. In statically typed languages, you tell the computer what data type the variable is going to be. So for example, in Java, if you're going to write a number, you write uh, int and then the name of the variable, and then you assign the value. So the way this works is that by writing the keyword int, the computer knows that it's going to save something and they know it, it's going to be a whole number that it needs to save. Um, and this varies from language to language, how it works. And there's a couple of pros and cons with this. Um, the pros are that if you use uh, keywords that specify the data type, um, the computer can optimize its, um, its performance and memory because it knows how much space to reserve. And that means that programs could be smaller, they could be more um, run smoother uh, because they don't need to take everything into account. They know exactly what's needed for, for your specific data type. So to contrast that, we have dynamically typed languages. Uh, JavaScript is one of them. You don't specify the data type. So what are the pros of that? Well, it's a lot more flexible. And in Java, if you uh, specify for the computer that, hey, reserve this number, it's going to be an int, and you write a string of characters, it's going to give you an error. In uh, JavaScript, you don't need to think about that. You don't need to think about the fact that um, you need to have a specific keyword depending on what data type. You just create the space for whatever you want and then specify what's the value. Um, and there's no error. You can write let number equals hello. It doesn't make any sense reading the, the variable name number that is going to be hello, but you can do it and, and the computer is not going to complain. So this allows for a lot of flexibility, a lot of um, uh, dynamic usage. Uh, if you had a number as your value, you can just easily change it into a, a string of characters or a string. Um, but this can also lead to some uh, unexpected uh, behaviors. Because the computer doesn't complain when you change it into something different um, in that sense, or if a program expands um, is meant to do a calculation and you send in a string of characters, um, the program just says doesn't work, but it doesn't specify why. In Java, if you write int and you type in a string, it's going to say, hey, this isn't a number, what are you doing? In, uh, in um, Java, hold on. In JavaScript, if you, um, you say, add this variable and this variable together, so this plus this, and you send in a string of characters instead of a number, it's just gonna go, eh, I don't know, undefined. It's not going to specify what's wrong, it's just gonna tell you that something is wrong. So it has these pros and cons, and it ha they, they have their usages and their applications. Um, for the web, you deal a lot with input where you don't know what the input is going to be. So having a dynamic uh, language is very useful, but it does also lead to uh, potential errors and it's more difficult to problem solve when something goes wrong. Um, and in programs that need to be more tight and optimized, and maybe they're bigger and they need to be better at uh, preserving memory and computation uh, power, um, being more specific, it helps you to save that space, but it also helps you to figure out what's wrong a lot faster. But it doesn't offer the same flexibility. 
maybe in those cases you don't need that flexibility. So it's really about use case to use case and not what's better or what's worse. Um, if you're used to straight away getting an answer about what's wrong, then you're gonna struggle in the beginning when the computer just tells you that something's wrong, but you need to figure it out when it just says undefined or couldn't run. Um, and if you're used to the flexibility of dynamically typed languages, you're gonna maybe struggle a bit with that lack of, um, of room. You're gonna struggle that, oh yeah, I defined that as a number and now I can't put something else into that variable. If you're used to that sort of workflow, you might get frustrated. But all of this sort of disappears once you get a little bit used to it. Um, it's not a problem that persists and a lot of people might have a preference, but can switch easily back and forth between the two. So let's continue with our uh, fake uh, calculator. So we've defined our numbers. We've uh, um, defined our, our variables. We have let number A is five and let number B equals five, uh, six, so that we're not confused, five and six. So we have the data that we're going to manipulate. So what do we do now? Now we're going to add them together. So obviously we can't add anything together if we haven't defined those numbers. So we need to think about the fact that code is sequential. Code runs from the top of the program to the bottom of the program. It reads one line and then when it's done with that line and, and has executed what's on that line, it jumps to the next line, execute that, executes that line, jumps to the next line, and so on and so on and so forth. So if you write add number A uh, and number B together before you've defined them, the computer has no idea what number A and number B is. So you need to remember that uh, your code needs to have a logical flow. You cannot add two number, you cannot ask the computer to add two numbers together that it doesn't know exists. You cannot um, write, for example, name equals Anna, and then lower down, write let uh, name equals something, because the let keyword creates the variable, and just the variable name equals an, uh, and some, some type of value that updates the variable. So you can't update something that the computer hasn't saved in its memory, that it doesn't know exists. So you need to think about the logical flow, kind of like if you were making a cake. You can't mix the milk and eggs together if you haven't bought any milk. You need to do that first before you can mix stuff together. You can't uh, preheat the oven. Well, you can't preheat the oven. You can't um, put the, put the um, uh, oven form or the the the, the uh, cake, the, the thing that's going to contain the cake into the oven without pouring the batter and expecting to get a cake. Um, your code needs to define the data that it's going to um, uh, work with first. It needs to ask the computer to save that space in its memory. Then you can update uh, that data, that information, those variables and you can manipulate and use those variables in your code. So doing it in the wrong order um, is going to give an error because the computer doesn't know what you're talking about. It doesn't have a variable saved. It doesn't have anything to update. So then if everything we write, the bits and bytes, um, is the building blocks, right? then logic and algorithms is how we choose to arrange these, these bits and bytes and these instructions. So you, you've probably heard the, the word algorithm a million times and people use it with, uh, with confidence without really understanding what it means. Um, an algorithm is um, the, the most efficient and applicable way to solve a problem. So let's get into an example. Essentially an algorithm before the example is a step-by-step -step instruction to solve a problem. 
An algorithm could be to provide the most efficient way to get to the nearest gas station. So you would say, um, uh, go down the stairs, turn to the right, walk 10 meters, turn to the left, walk 30 meters. That's where the, and, and you'll end up at the gas station. And you could solve that problem in a million ways. You could tell them to go the opposite direction and, and um, go in, t in circles around the gas station and then a spiral that gets closer and closer and closer. You'll still get, you're still gonna get to the gas station, but it's not very efficient. Uh, and it's not really the, the quickest way to solve that problem. So algorithms uh, are step-by-step step by step instructions to solve something as quickly, efficiently, and as smoothly as possible. Um, you could, if you're making a cake, you could mix your batter using a feather. That's going to take a long time, but you can do it. And what, what algorithms allow us to do is that if there's uh, problems that a lot of programmers have encountered before, there might be the most efficient way to do it. Um, and then an algorithm that maybe is known is that, well, a hundred thousand uh, programmers, programmers before me uh, had to do exactly what I did. So they've developed the most efficient way to do this. So I can just look it up online, learn to under understand it, and then use it in my code. Um, so when people say algorithms, the algorithm did this, the algorithm did that, it is just, yeah, somebody thought of the most efficient way to express this in code and lots of other people maybe use it. That is an algorithm, a way to solve a problem efficiently and you can do it, uh, you can use that, you can apply that way of solving that problem uh, many times over. And when talking about coding, we also hear the word logic a lot, which is very broad in general, doesn't really say anything. Well, we've already mentioned something that uh, logic um, that could be contained under logic, and that is uh, the sequential nature of code. You, it's logical that you need to have eggs before you can add eggs to your cake. That is a logical flow of execution. That's part of logic, the sequential nature, and the fact that, you know what, the computer needs to have saved a value before you can use that value. That is one big basic thing of, uh, or component of logic. The other big component is the use of uh, comparisons and conditions uh, in order to um, evaluate if something is going to happen. Um, I've used this example a bunch of times, but it is just very, very um, great to uh, sh showcase how this works. So you want to evaluate a condition. Is the light green or red? <laughs> um, if it's green, you walk, and if it's red, you stop. So logic here is first checking what is the condition, light, green or red, and based on that condition, the computer takes different actions. That is logic as well. And this is the, the one of the most basic, fundamental, and mostly used um, logic statements within programming. Uh, so if we translate this into code speak, it's going to be an if-then statement. So, Based on anything, let's say, if hungry, eat. Else, don't eat. Um, and here's what I've ta been talking about, uh, of learning how to express yourself in a way that the computer understands here. Um, learning how to take what you want the computer to do and put it in that type of statement. Here's the condition. And based on this condition, do this action. Sometimes you kind of forget other parts of, of, of the condition. Like I said, if you're using the idea of crossing the streets, maybe just if the light is green is not the only variable, the only uh, necessary um, decision point. What if the light is green and there's a car speeding anyway? 
Um, so then maybe you need to specify that if the light is green and there are no cars, then you can walk. Um, the if then statement is the basis for all of this. Um, but one does need to remember that you cannot encapsulate every single decision point into uh, if light green, then walk. Similarly, we used uh, an analogy for, for being at a bar and I used if over 18, have beer. Um, but what if that person is over 18 and incredibly drunk? I mean, it's illegal then to, uh, to sell, uh, sell beer to them. So that's another condition that the computer would need to evaluate to see uh, what action it might take. But at, as, at its basic foundation, basic level, an if-then statement evaluates something and based on that evaluation takes different courses of action. So when you use comparison uh, or when you evaluate conditions, you don't only check if something is green or if something is true or false. You can also uh, compare different numbers together. And one great example is uh, temperature. So you, you want to go outside and you look at, at the thermometer and you think to yourself, if the temperature is above 20, I won't bring a jacket. But if it's below 20, then, it's then I will bring a jacket. So you would be able to hear um, compare the numbers for the temperature and based on that condition if temperature is larger than 20 bring jacket if temperature is lower than 20 sorry i got that mixed up if temperature is larger than 20 don't bring jacket if it's lower than 20 bring jacket so this is another type of evaluation that you need uh, that you can do as a programmer comparing values to each other and if one number is larger there's one set of actions and if the other is larger there's another set of actions so when you code um, you have all these keywords all these um, expressions that you might need to look at to understand and get into and really analyze and it can be hard uh, when there's a uh, when there's a jumble of stuff on your screen. So what we usually do is we use something called indentation. So um, in your code, you'll see that um, you have space uh, on each uh, line of code uh, in the beginning and you move in your text. And when you start coding, you're going to understand what, what this does and, and, and when to use that. But for now, all you need to know is that this is done in most languages to make it readable for you. You could write all of your code in most languages on one single line and the compu computer will understand. So these spaces in the beginning of lines in most languages is for uh, is so that it is more readable to you as the coder or whoever is reading uh, your code. Um, it makes it easy to visually identify, um, okay, here we have an if statement and here is the, the condition and under that is what happens uh, if that condition is fulfilled. So then you can just visually see what is happening what is related, like if this is related to the thing above it, just by looking at it. Um, and the computer doesn't need this. This is for your benefit, except for in one language, which is Python. So in Python, you use these spaces in the beginning of lines to structure your code. No, uh, as far as I can tell, no other language uses spaces themselves to structure code. Um, a lot of the times in other languages, when you, um, when you say where the code starts and ends, you use these uh, squiggly parentheses. Um, you have a block of code and you, say, and you have a squiggly parenthesis and then you have the end squiggly parenthesis and that tells the computer, hey, here's the block of code. This is one unit of code here. Um, in 
Python, instead of these squiggly, uh, squiggly parentheses, you use the spaces in the beginning of lines. If you don't have any space in the beginning of a line, that tells the computer that it's a start or end of that block of code. So it's, it's only for th this, I, want, I wanted to share this just so that you, if you look at different code and you see that or this, and it's confusing because you have indentation everywhere, everyone uses that so that they can visually structure and understand their code. And then in Python, you also have that, but it means something else and you don't have any, any squiggly parentheses there. So what's up with that? And here you have the indentation and the squiggly. I just wanted to um, briefly mention that so you understand the purpose of it in most languages uh, and what it does. So it's, so it's human readable, but also in Python, it's necessary to define the structure of the code, uh, just to try to eliminate some of the confusion there. So I think, believe we've come to the end of this video. And the last thing I want uh, to leave you with is, um, I want you to understand that computers are super dumb. They're so, so dumb. They're so literal. They only do exactly what you tell them to do. And they break everything down into these teeny tiny tasks and they can't do a lot, you know? One thing they do have is that they are so fast, so, so fast. And when they do these tiny, stupid, tiny, tiny things as fast as they do, it gives an illusion that they're very smart. They look smart because they do stuff really, really fast. Um, but, but they're not. Um, it's not that they're smart and you need to att get to the level of the computer. It's the fact that you need to get to the stupid level of the computer and talk to it in the stupid way that it understands. Because then when you run your code, it's going to execute it so fast that you're not going to see when it runs the instructions that you gave it. Um, when we try to look for mistakes or when we try to do something called debugging, we say, hey, when you run this code, can you please stop on this specific line so that I can examine it? Because once you run your code and it executes it, it goes so fast that you don't see the immediate effect of what you wrote. It's so, so fast. So please understand, computers are dumb. Learn to talk to them as literal, precise, um, make it idiot proof. There's this great video online um, where a father is trying to um, teach the principle of, of how a computer is stupid to his kids. So he asks them, hey, can you explain to me how to make a peanut butter sandwich? So the kids give him instructions. So they're like, well, you put the peanut butter on the bread. So he puts the jar of the peanut uh, with the peanut butter on top of a slice of bread because he's being very literal here. And they laugh and they say, no, 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 you have to unscrew the lid first. So he unscrews the lid and again puts the jar on the bread because that's how computers work, really. Um, and the kids start to get frustrated. They're like, no, you use a knife. Use a knife and put the peanut butter on the bread. So then he takes the knife, puts it the wrong end in, takes some peanut butter and puts it on just one corner on the side of the bread. The kids start getting even more frustrated. Like, no, don't you understand? Of course you put it on the, on the top. Um, and this video is, it's not super long, but it, it goes to show how, um, how to express yourself in such a manner to a computer that it is idiot proof and that some, anybody could understand the instruction. You don't put the peanut butter on the bread. You hold the jar in one hand, you take your hand and you unscrew the lid of the jar. You put away the jar, you put the jar on the table, you pick up the knife in the ha with the handle, then you put, then while still holding the knife, you insert the knife into the jar. Uh, while still holding it, you scoop up a tablespoon of peanut butter on the sharp end, etc., 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 etc. So you describe your instructions in such a way 
that uh, an idiot would understand it because that's what computers are. But they're so fast that they look really, really smart. So that is a little bit about the nitty gritty about of coding. So you have variables that hold data. They have types. You as the programmer need to define them. The, the computer saves it in memory. Once it's saved in memory, you can reference the name of the variable and the computer will give you the value. Once you have your data, you can perform manipulations on it. If you try to perform manipulations on a variable you haven't defined, the computer doesn't know what to do because it doesn't know uh, what variable you're talking about because it hasn't saved it in space. So code is sequential. You need to do things in a certain order. You need to have your ingredients before you mix them. Uh, logic is part of this, doing it in sequence, but it's also evaluating um, conditions and taking an action based on that condition. An algorithm, which people like to use uh, and throw around as if they know what it means, is simply a specific step-by-step -step way of solving a problem in the most efficient way possible. It's giving the clearest directions to the nearest gas stations, uh, gas station, um, so that it takes the least amount of effort and time to get there. That is an algorithm. Um, and when you're coding, um, you need to remember that the computer is stupid, but fast. And you need to explain what you want in a way that, it, that um, anyone could understand it without any uh, misinterpretations. So thank you so much for listening to this video. I hope that it made the actual sitting down and writing the first line of code a bit easier. Um, and I'll see you in, in the next video. Thank you so much.